<laughs> okay. I gotta move everything up. You shorties. <laughs> That's perfect. Thanks. You're welcome, babe. Um, okay. I'm terrified. <laughs> terrified. Um, but I'm also really thankful to have, uh, I guess, gotten to share this space with the women who've come before me in a real yeah. way. Um, oh, man. Okay. <laughs> um, so I tried to trim mine down. It was crazy long in the beginning. Um, sorry. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Me together, everyone. <laughs> um, and so I shaved some off the top. Uh, basically, I was pregnant. Family was super pumped. Um, <laughs> it took me <laughs> five minutes worth of words to say that. <laughs> um, so now let's get to, I guess, what I actually did get to keep. Um, so it was two days after Christmas. The first, I'm going to stick straight to the paper. Um, the first day, my doctor's office opened back up after the holidays, and I'd went in for a checkup. I used to hate visiting the doctor. I used to hate scheduling appointments, sitting in waiting rooms, standing on scales, and laying on tables covered with paper. But in this season of life, I found myself pumped to go to the doctor's. I was excited to see him, find him on a monitor, hear his heartbeat in the computer speakers, and learn how big he'd gotten. And today was no different. I'd been scheduled for one of those 3D ultrasounds because there had been a genetic scare early on. But I wasn't fearful. I knew my guy was fine. I was excited to get a good look at him, watch him slide around what I'd finally called his little pocket on the ultrasound. His legs were long and stretched, and it excited me to know my baby was going to be tall, like me, and his trifling father, sorry, he really is the worst, <laughs> as the nurse read off his measurements. I, re I reveled in the thought of looking up at my boy one day. I played out my last basketball game with him in my mind, the one where I could feel myself barely winning, and I'd stop there. Retire forever so that my 6'5 son would have to tell the world that he'd never beat his mama in a game of basketball. <laughs> the nurse took down the rest of his information and left out the room. Maybe 15 minutes passed and another nurse entered and asked us to sit in the small conference room where the doctor would come and walk us through the results. <laughs> My genetics doctor was cold and distant, always. Um, so I looked forward to getting this part out the way, but today he seemed a little different. He read a bunch of stuff off of a piece of paper before I realized that he wasn't his usual paranoid self, but that something was really wrong. Um, I sat back trying to play catch up and put the pieces together. So wait, something really may be wrong with baby Jay. I hadn't gotten used to calling him Amara yet. Um, that he's sick, underweight, and that my placenta is hurting him. Now if you know me, you know I'm insanely territorial, and you know I'm wildly protective. But I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to protect my baby from me. Um, I was forced to go straight to the hospital. When I got checked into my first room, a doctor from NICU laid out all the facts. Ran through statistics of survival like tales of a Grizzlies game. 10% this, less than 5% that. Um, and I hadn't caught my breath from the doctor's office to the hospital. And I laid on a bed that felt like a gymnastics mat with a head, my, my head smashed against a flimsy pillow, listening to a doctor read off my baby's chances. Um, I didn't cry during my practice either. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> All right. Um, at some point, at some point, I began to tune her out and began to calculate my own likelihood. If my newfound reason to be good, to be kind, to love, to live, if my reason to live didn't live, what was I supposed to do? Uh, I weighed my options in an effort to make the news a bit more bearable and decided while laying on, in the dark corner of the Baptist Memorial Hospital that if he died, I would too. I'd grant myself the grace not to learn how to live without him. I laid my head back and stared at the ceiling tiles while trying to imagine what it would be like to hold my baby boy until, uh, until I felt his last breath leave his body. And I knew I wasn't strong enough to bear that cross. I could feel myself crumbling at the thought, so I began to think through. I have to get through this. I need y'all to know his story. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, began to think through ways I could easily and effectively rid myself of the burden of having to learn to exist in a world where he didn't. The, and that thought is the only thing that got me through the next few weeks to come. I stayed there for two weeks on bed rest under constant surveillance, constant surveillance, an ultrasound a day, two fetal Dopplers, four shots, 
in my butt a day <laughs> to thin my blood and weekly baby weight checks. On the second weight check, my, my son still wasn't getting the nutrition he needed. So the next day, every one of my doctors, that's genetics, OBGYN, and NICU, and their nurses came by to talk me through next steps. I was giving birth tomorrow. I remember being both the most excited and terrified I'd ever been at the exact same time. My family came that night, gifts in hands, to have a makeshift baby shower so my man wouldn't come into the world with no clothes. Once they left, I asked the nurse for an Ambien. My mom would sleep on the couch with my sister and my aunt on the lazy boy. And I laid there in the dark, surrounded by loved ones, praying to God by every name I'd heard, ever heard him referred to as. I bargained everything I had, some things I didn't, begging whoever could hear me that Amari make it into this world safely. In the morning, I was rolled into a room full of strangers, faces covered with paper masks, and they scurried around me, busying themselves with machines, with needles and equipment, while the NICU doctor explained to me my three options. <clears throat> if he looks like he has trisomy 18, Google it later, I don't have that long to explain what that is, um, we won't take any heroic measures. I'll bring him to you and give you as much time with him as I can. And if it's clear he does not have trisomy 18, I will do everything I can to preserve life. And if I cannot tell, you'll have to make the call. After my spinal tap, I laid there, street, sheet drawn between me and the action with steady tears rolling down my face, not from pain, but sheer anxiety. My mother was next to my head and a nurse I wouldn't know if she was sitting in this audience right here and now, offside alone, ran her fingers over my face while she prayed for me. There was yanking and pulling from inside, but no pain. My usually queasy mother, and when I say queasy, I mean queasy, <laughs> peeked over the sheet and said, there he is, and I could feel him leave me. The NICU doctor came to my side and said, quickly, Ms. Jones, I can't tell. What do you want me to do? And everything you can. <laughs> I shouted quickly between tears. I felt them pulling me back together and could see the doctor standing over where I imagined my baby was. And I heard him mutter some cuss words and a few, come on, man, come on, man. And as I smelled something burning and he yelled, bingo, we got it. The nurse above me stopped praying and told me to look to my left as they wheeled my baby past me to get him to NICU. It was hours before I got to see my son for the first time. I walked in NICU, still hazy from the drugs, sore from where I'd been split open, and looked into the plastic case where my son was hooked up to a bunch of machines with his face covered to shield him from the lights in the room. He was tiny, <laughs> like so tiny. Um, and I sat in the room with my firstborn son and reminded myself that I still had choices. And if I couldn't save him, that I, wouldn't have a, uh, that I would have a choice whether or not I would choose to save myself. I'd have six days with my son, and in that time I would learn more about love, strength, and bravery than I've learned in my 20, this says 26, I'm 27 now. 20, oh no, no, I was 26 at the time, that makes sense. 26 years combined. <laughs> um, before I could feel the overwhelming love and excitement that comes with meeting your child for the first time face to face, I felt fear. I felt a fear that he was too small, that he was too sick, too weak, that I wouldn't be able to I wouldn't have him long enough or hold him long enough, love him long enough. Um, and in a self-preservation attempt, I felt myself raise my guards, raise my walls high enough to stop myself from falling in love. I didn't want to give him the room to break my heart. <laughs> I barely visited his room the first day. I stayed on my side of the hospital where I could work on these walls, work on bracing myself for the doom that felt inevitable. I didn't know what to say to him. My fear wouldn't give me the space to find the words. So my sister, being the intuitive gem that she is, brought me a book, Dumbo. Knowing I was having a hard time in my search for things to say, she told me to let the words from the book fill the space until I could locate my own. I worked through the short picture book, excited to have a thing to do with him. Amara's godfather used to tell me to take life in moments without projecting, wondering, or hoping. Accept where you are and find peace in that place. I allowed myself to lean into that idea as I flipped through the pages and read line by line as I found love in the words on the page. It was the longest conversation I'd had with him. Um, and I fell. I fell really hard. Um, it was in that moment I learned a concept I'm continuously working to reinforce that true love happens when you're at peace. Happiness, anger, jealousy, romance, and a bunch of other emotion, emotions are like waves, some larger than others, that exist on the top of this ocean that can be peace. Sometimes we have to ride those waves, but life is going to happen in tidal waves and tsunamis, but swim deep enough to find the peace. In every situation, that you can love fearlessly and forever. Um, Amari was a thoughtful teacher. 
And in shirt, I would have an example. I made the type so big so I could read it. <laughs> so many pages. Um, the, the, that type of piece requires, Amara was born three months premature. He was one pound, a really tiny thing, uh, that came with a series of health, health issues. He was supposed to be still in the oven on high, and he was sitting in a plastic box in the world fighting to make it. He had scare after scare, and at some point, I wasn't strong enough to watch the fight. My doctor called a meeting with me and all of Amari's nurses in his room as we discussed options. Day three, and I was ready to pull his plug. I was tired, and I was sad, and watching him fight for fear of, of watching him fight for fear he was, he was suffering, and I thought it was time. As his doctor talked through options, um, my aunt nudged me and whispered in my ear, I think he's giving you his answer. And I looked over at my son in his little plastic box and he was going ham. He was punching and he was kicking like, you better not pull this plug. <laughs> we got some more stuff to cover. And I laughed, which I didn't do a lot. As long as he's fighting, I will too. In my time with him, our conversations began to feel real, real spiritual. I sat with my head laid on the table next to him most days and listened to him breathe through his ventilator. Scare after scare, I watched him locate strength to continue his fight until all my lessons were shared. I found the strength I didn't know I had, and I fought to support him, to love, believe, and find peace in the moments. It's easy to relinquish hope when faced with impossible circumstances, but it takes strength to hope in hopeless situations. And Amari, through example, showed me how to fight. On his last day, Amari hit a wall. He had been relying on his ventilator at 20% until this day. And throughout the day, nurses came in and out to adjust his ventilator. And by sunset, his oxygen intake was on 100%. And at 100%, there's little the nurses could do. And continuous adjustments would just cause a, a hole in his lung. I knew this was my son's last day. I knew he had fought the fight he was intended to. And anything past that would be based on my own selfishness. So I notified his doctor that I was ready to take him off the ventilator. They took Amari out of his little plastic box and granted me the opportunity to hold my baby for the very first time. And I sat in the recline with my son on top of my chest, directly above my heart. The moment I imagined the first night at the hospital, and it arrived. My baby held on for a long time. And we sat in that uncomfortable hospital chair as he walked me through my final lesson, and that was bravery. With ideas, and love, with ideas of love and strength kind of lingering overhead, I had to find the bravery to survive, the bravery to find peace, the bravery to believe in my own strength and continue my walk towards hope. I sang through tears, songs about love, trying to squeeze in the lullabies I knew I wanted to sing my first son, songs my son needed to hear with his worldly ears before he transitioned. While I sang, he guided my spirit towards an understanding that he would never leave me that I would never be alone again. And my son would take every step I was willing to and carry me over the ones I wasn't. I found my bravery to survive in the strength it takes to love my son without being able to hold him, rock him, or hear his voice. I feel him every day, and while some are harder, I, I feel him every day. And while some are harder than others, I am comforted knowing I walk on the shoulders of my own giant, and his name is William Amari Jones. And we walk together in and <laughs> day in and day out towards hope. The end. <laughs>